Section 14 of State of the Union Addresses, 1849 through 1856. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary B. Clayton. State of the Union Address, Franklin Pierce, December 31, 1855, Part 2. The Army during the past year has been actively engaged in defending the Indian frontier, the state of the service permitting but few and small garrisons in our permanent fortifications. The additional regiments authorized at the last session of Congress have been recruited and organized, and a large portion of the troops have already been sent to the field. All the duties which devolve on the military establishment have been satisfactorily performed, and the dangers and privations incident to the character of the service required of our troops have furnished additional evidence of their courage, zeal, and capacity to meet any requisition which their country may make upon them. For the details of the military operations, the distribution of the troops, and additional provisions required for the military service, I refer to the report of the Secretary of War and the accompanying documents. Experience gathered from events which have transpired since my last annual message has but served to confirm the opinion then expressed of the propriety of making provision by a retired list for disabled officers and for increasing compensation to the officers retained on the list for active duty. All the reasons which existed when these measures were recommended on former occasions continue without modification, except so far as circumstances have given to some of them additional force. The recommendations heretofore made for a partial reorganization of the Army are also renewed. The thorough elementary education given to those officers who commenced their service with the grade of cadet qualifies them to a considerable extent to perform the duties of every arm of the service. But to give the highest efficiency to artillery requires the practice and special study of many years, and it is not therefore believed to be advisable to maintain in time of peace a larger force of that arm than can be usually employed in the duties appertaining to the service of field and siege artillery the duties of the staff in all its various branches belong to the movements of troops and the efficiency of an army in the field would materially depend upon the ability with which those duties are discharged it is not as in the case of the artillery a specialty but requires also an intimate knowledge of the duties of an officer of the line. And it is not doubted that to complete the education of an officer for either the line or the general staff, it is desirable that he shall have served in both. With this view, it was recommended on a former occasion that the duties of the staff should be mainly performed by details from the line, and, with conviction of the advantages which would result from such a change, it is again presented for the consideration of Congress. The report of the Secretary of the Navy, herewith submitted, exhibits in full the naval operations of the past year, together with the present condition of the service, and it makes suggestions of further legislation to which your attention is invited. The construction of the six steam frigates for which appropriations were made by the last Congress has proceeded in the most satisfactory manner, and with such expenditure as to warrant the belief that they will be ready for service early in the coming spring. Important as this addition to our naval force is, it still remains inadequate to the contingent exigencies of the protection of the extensive seacoast and vast commercial interests of the United States. In view of this fact and of the acknowledged wisdom of the policy of a gradual and systematic increase of the Navy, an appropriation is recommended for the construction of six steam sloops of war. In regard to the steps taken in execution of the Act of Congress to promote the efficiency of the Navy, it is unnecessary for me to say more than to express entire concurrence in the observations on that subject presented by the Secretary in his report. It will be perceived by the report of the Postmaster General that the gross expenditure of the Department for the last fiscal year was $9,968,342, and the gross receipts $7,342,136 making an excess of expenditure over receipts of $2,626,206, and that the cost of mail transportation during that year was $674,952 greater than the previous year. 
much of the heavy expenditures to which the treasury is thus subjected is to be ascribed to the large quantity of printed matter conveyed by the mails either franked or liable to no postage by law or to very low rates of postage compared with that charge on letters and to the great cost of mail service on railroads and by ocean steamers the suggestions of the postmaster general on the subject deserve the considerations of congress the report of the secretary of the interior will engage your attention as well for useful suggestions it contains as for the interest and importance of the subjects to which they refer the aggregate amount of public land sold during the last fiscal year located with military script or land warrants taken up under grants for roads and selected as swamp lands by states is twenty four million five hundred fifty seven thousand four hundred nine acres of which the portion sold was fifteen million seven hundred twenty nine thousand five hundred twenty four acres yielding in receipts the sum of eleven million four hundred eighty five thousand three hundred and eighty dollars in the same period of time eight million seven hundred twenty three thousand eight hundred and fifty four acres have been surveyed but in consideration of the quantity already subject to entry no additional tracts have been brought into market the peculiar relation of the general government to the district of columbia renders it proper to commend to your care not only its material but also its moral interests including education more especially in those parts of the district outside of the cities of washington and georgetown the commissioners appointed to revise and codify the laws of the district have made such progress in the performance of their task as to ensure its completion in the time prescribed by the act of congress information has recently been received that the peace of the settlements in the territories of oregon and washington is disturbed by hostilities on the part of the indians with indications of extensive combinations of a hostile character among the tribes in that quarter the more serious in their possible effect by reason of the undetermined foreign interests existing in those territories to which your attention has already been especially invited efficient measures have been taken which it is believed will restore quiet and afford protection to our citizens in the territory of kansas there have been acts prejudicial to good order but as yet none have occurred under circumstances to justify the interposition of the federal executive that could only be in case of obstruction to federal law or of organized resistance to territorial law assuming the character of insurrection which if it should occur it would be my duty promptly to overcome and suppress i cherish the hope however that the occurrence of any such untoward event will be prevented by the sound sense of the people of the territory who by its organic law possessing the right to determine their own domestic institutions are entitled while deporting themselves peacefully to the free exercise of that right and must be protected in the enjoyment of it without interference on the part of the citizens of any of the states the southern boundary line of this territory has never been surveyed and established the rapidly extending settlements in that region and the fact that the main route between independence and the state of missouri and new mexico is contiguous in this line suggests the probability that embarrassing questions of jurisdiction may consequently arise for these and other considerations i commend the subject to your early attention i have thus passed in review the general state of the union including such particular concerns of the federal government whether of domestic or foreign relation as it appeared to me desirable and useful to bring to the special notice of congress unlike the great states of europe and asia and many of those of america these united states are wasting their strength neither in foreign war nor domestic strife whatever of discontent or public dissatisfaction exists is attributable to the imperfections of human nature or is incident to all governments however perfect which human wisdom can devise such subjects of political agitation as occupy the public mind consist to a great extent of exaggeration of inevitable evils or over zeal in social improvement or mere imagination of grievance having but remote connection with any of the constitutional functions or duties of the federal government to whatever extent these questions exhibit a tendency menacing to the stability of the constitution or the integrity of the union and no further they demand the consideration of the executive and require to be presented by him to congress before the thirteen colonies became a confederation of independent states 
they were associated only by community of transatlantic origin by geographical position and by the mutual tie of common dependence on great britain when that tie was sundered they severally assumed the powers and rights of absolute self-government the municipal and social institutions of each its laws of property and of personal relation even its political organization were such only as each one chose to establish wholly without interference from any other in the language of the declaration of independence each state had quote, full power to levy war con conclude peace contract alliances establish commerce and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do end quote. the several colonies differ in climate in soil in natural productions in religion in systems of education in legislation and in the forms of political administration and they continued to differ in those respects when they voluntarily allied themselves as states to carry on the war of the revolution the object of that war was to disenthrall the united colonies from foreign rule which had proved to be oppressive and to separate them permanently from the mother country the political result was the foundation of a federal republic of the free white men of the colonies constituted as they were in distinct and reciprocally independent state governments as for the subject races whether indian or african the wise and brave statesmen of that day being engaged in no extravagant scheme of social change left them as they were and thus preserved themselves and their posterity from the anarchy and the ever-recurring civil wars which have prevailed in other revolutionized european colonies of america when the confederated states found it convenient to modify the conditions of their association by giving to the general government direct access in some respects to the people of the states instead of confining it to action on the states as such they proceeded to frame the existing constitution adhering steadily to one guiding thought which was to delegate only such power as was necessary and proper to the execution of specific purposes or in other words to retain as much as possible consistently with those purposes of the independent powers of the individual states for objects of common defense and security they entrusted to the general government certain carefully defined functions leaving all others as the undelegated rights of the separate independent sovereignties such is the constitutional theory of our government the practical observance of which has carried us and us alone among modern republics through nearly three generations of time without the cost of one drop of blood shed in civil war with freedom and concert of action it has enabled us to contend successfully on the battlefield against foreign foes has elevated the feeble colonies into powerful states and has raised our industrial productions and our commerce which transports them to the level of the richest and the greatest nations of europe and the admirable adaptation of our political institutions to their objects combining local self-government with aggregate strength has established a practicality of a government like ours to cover a continent with confederate states the congress of the united states is in effect that congress of sovereignties which good men in the old world have sought for but could never attain and which imparts to america an exemption from the mutable leagues for common action from the wars the mutual invasions and vague aspirations after the balance of power which convulse from time to time the governments of europe our cooperative action rests in the conditions of permanent confederation prescribed by the constitution our balance of power is in the separate reserve rights of the states and their equal representation in the senate that independent sovereignty in every one of the states with its reserved rights of local self-government assured to each by their co-equal power in the senate was the fundamental condition of the constitution without it the union would never have existed however desirous the larger states might be to reorganize the government so as to give to their population its proportionate weight in the common councils they knew it was impossible unless they conceded to the smaller ones authority to exercise at least a negative influence on all the measures of the government whether legislative or executive through their equal representation in the senate indeed the larger states themselves could not have failed to perceive that the same power was equally necessary to them for the security of their own domestic interests against the aggregate force of the general government 
in a word the original states went into this permanent league on the agreed premises of exerting their common strength for the defense of the whole and of all its parts but of utterly excluding all capability of reciprocal aggression each solemnly bound itself to all the others neither to undertake nor permit any encroachment upon or intermeddling with another's reserved rights where it was deemed expedient particular rights of the states were expressly guaranteed by the constitution but in all things besides these rights were guarded by the limitation of the powers granted and by express reservation of all powers not granted in the compact of union thus the great power of taxation was limited to purposes of common defense and general welfare excluding objects appertaining to the local legislation of the several states and those purposes of general welfare and common defense were afterwards defined by specific enumeration as being matters only of correlation between the states themselves or between them and foreign governments which because of their common and general nature could not be left to the separate control of each state of the circumstances of local condition interest and rights in which a portion of the states constituting one great section of the union differed from the rest and from another section the most important was the peculiarity of a larger relative colored population in the southern than in the northern states a population of this class held in subjection existed in nearly all the states but was more numerous and of more serious concernment in the south than in the north on account of natural differences of climate and production and it was foreseen that for the same reasons while this population would diminish and sooner or later cease to exist in some states it might increase in others the peculiar character and magnitude of this question of local rights not in material relations only but still more in social ones caused it to enter into the special stipulations of the constitution hence while the general government as well by the enumerated powers granted to it as by those not enumerated and therefore refused to it was forbidden to touch this matter in the sense of attack or offense it was placed under the general safeguard of the union in the sense of defense against either invasion or domestic violence like all other local interests of the several states each state expressly stipulated as well for itself as for each and all of its citizens and every citizen of each state became solemnly bound by his allegiance to the constitution that any person held to service or labor in one state escaping into another should not in consequence of any law or regulation thereof be discharged from such service or labor but should be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor might be due by the laws of his state thus and thus only by the reciprocal guarantee of all the rights of every state against interference on the part of another was the present form of government established by our fathers and transmitted to us and by no other means is it possible for it to exist if one state ceases to respect the rights of another and obtrusively intermeddles with its local interests if a portion of the states assume to impose their institutions on the others or refuse to fulfill their obligations to them we are no longer united friendly states but distracted hostile ones with little capacity left of common advantage but abundant means of reciprocal injury and mischief practically it is immaterial whether aggressive interference between the states or deliberate refusal on the part of any one of them to comply with constitutional obligations arise from erroneous conviction or blind prejudice whether it be perpetrated by direction or indirection in either case it is full of threat and of danger to the durability of the union placed in the office of chief magistrate as the executive agent of the whole country bound to take care that the laws be faithfully executed and specially enjoined by the constitution to give information to congress on the state of the union it would be palpable neglect of duty on my part to pass over a subject like this which beyond all things at the present time vitally concerns individual and public security it has been matter of painful regret to see states conspicuous for their services in rounding this republic and equally sharing its advantages disregard their constitutional obligations to it 
although conscious of their inability to heal admitted and palpable social evils of their own and which are completely within their jurisdiction they engage in the offensive and hopeless undertaking of reforming the domestic institutions of other states wholly beyond their control and authority in the vain pursuit of ends by them entirely unattainable and which they may not legally attempt to compass they peril the very existence of the constitution and all the countless benefits which it has conferred while the people of the southern states confine their attention to their own affairs not presuming officiously to intermeddle with the social institutions of the northern states too many of the inhabitants of the latter are permanently organized in associations to inflict injury on the former by wrongful acts which would be cause of war as between foreign powers and only fail to be such in our system because perpetuated under cover of the union is it possible to present this subject as truth and the occasion require without noticing the reiterated but groundless allegation that the south has persistently asserted claims and obtained advantages in the practical administration of the general government to the prejudice of the north and in which the latter has acquiesced that is the states which either promote or tolerate attacks on the rights of persons and of property in other states to disguise their own injustice pretend or imagine and constantly aver that they whose constitutional rights are thus systematically assailed are themselves the aggressors at the present time this imputed aggression resting as it does only in the vague declamatory charges of political agitators resolves itself into misapprehension or misinterpretation of the principles and facts of the political organization of the new territories of the united states what is the voice of history when the ordinance which provided for the government of the territory northwest of the river ohio and for its eventual subdivision into new states was adopted in the congress of the confederation is it not to be supposed that the question of future relative power as between the states which retained and those which did not retain a numerous colored population escaped notice or failed to be considered and yet the concession of that vast territory to the interests and opinions of the northern states a territory now the seat of five among the largest members of the union was in great measure the act of the state of virginia and of the south when louisiana was acquired by the united states it was an acquisition not less to the north than to the south for while it was important to the country at the mouth of the river mississippi to become the emporium of the country above it so also it was even more important to the whole union to have that emporium and although the new province by reason of its imperfect settlement was mainly regarded as on the gulf of mexico yet in fact it extended to the opposite boundaries of the united states with far greater breadth above than below and was in territory as in everything else equally at least an accession to the northern states it is mere delusion and prejudice therefore to speak of louisiana as acquisition in the special interests of the south the patriotic and just men who participated in the act were influenced by motives far above all sectional jealousies it was in truth the great event which by completing for us the possession of the valley of the mississippi with commercial access to the gulf of mexico imparted unity and strength to the whole confederation and attached together by indissoluble ties the east and the west as well as the north and the south as to florida that was but the transfer by spain to the united states of a territory on the east side of the river mississippi in exchange for large territory which the united states transferred to spain on the west side of that river as the entire diplomatic history of the transaction serves to demonstrate moreover it was an acquisition demanded by the commercial interests and the security of the whole union in the meantime the people of the united states had grown up to a proper consciousness of their strength and in a brief contest with france and in a second serious war with great britain they had shaken off all that which remained of undue reverence for europe and emerged from the atmosphere of those transatlantic influences which surrounded the infant republic and had begun to turn their attention to the full and systematic development of the internal resources of the union among the evanescent controversies of that period the most conspicuous was the question of regulation by congress of the social condition of the future states to be rounded in the territory of louisiana 
the ordinance for the government of the territory northwest of the river ohio had contained a provision which prohibited the use of servile labor therein subject to the condition of the extraditions of fugitives from service due in any other part of the united states subsequently to the adoption of the constitution this provision ceased to remain as a law for its operation as such was absolutely superseded by the constitution but the recollection of the fact excited the zeal of social propagandism in some sections of the confederation and when a second state that of missouri came to be formed in the territory of louisiana proposition was made to extend to the latter territory the restriction originally applied to the countries situated between the rivers ohio and mississippi most questionable as was this proposition in all its constitutional relations nevertheless it received the sanction of congress with some slight modifications of line to save the existing rights of the intended new state it was reluctantly acquiesced in by southern states as a sacrifice to the cause of peace and of the union not only of the rights stipulated by the treaty of louisiana but of the principle of equality among the states guaranteed by the constitution it was received by the northern states with angry and resentful condemnation and complaint because it did not concede all which they had exactingly demanded having passed through the forms of legislation it took its place in the statute book standing open to repeal like any other act of doubtful constitutionality subject to be pronounced null and void by the courts of law and possessing no possible efficacy to control the rights of the states which might thereafter be organized out of any part of the original territory of louisiana in all this if any aggression there were any innovation upon pre-existing rights to which portion of the union are they justly chargeable this controversy passed away with the occasion nothing surviving it save the dormant letter of the statute but long afterwards when by the proposed accession of the republic of texas the united states were to take their next step in territorial greatness a similar contingency occurred and became the occasion for systematized attempts to intervene in the domestic affairs of one section of the union in defiance of their rights as states and of the stipulations of the constitution these attempts assumed a practical direction in the shape of persevering endeavors by some of the representatives in both houses of congress to deprive the southern states of the supposed benefit of the provisions of the act authorizing the organization of the state of missouri but the good sense of the people and the vital force of the constitution triumphed over sectional prejudice and the political errors of the day and the state of texas returned to the union as she was with social institutions which her people had chosen for themselves and with express agreement by the re-annexing act that she should be susceptible of subdivision into a plurality of states whatever advantage the interests of the southern states as such gained by this were far inferior in results as they unfolded in the progress of time to those which sprang from previous concessions made by the south to every thoughtful friend of the union to the true lovers of their country to all who longed and labored for the full success of this great experiment of republican institutions it was cause of congratulation that such an opportunity had occurred to illustrate our advancing power on this continent and to furnish to the world additional assurance of the strength and stability of the constitution who would wish to see florida still a european colony who would rejoice to hail texas as a lone star instead of one in the galaxy of states who does not appreciate the incalculable benefits of the acquisition of louisiana and yet narrow views and sectional purposes would inevitably have excluded them all from the union but another struggle on the same point ensued when our victorious armies returned from mexico and it devolved on congress to provide for the territories acquired by the treaty of guadalupe hidalgo the great relations of the subject had now become distinct and clear to the perception of the public mind which appreciated the evils of sectional controversy upon the question of the admissions of new states in that crisis intense solicitude pervaded the nation but the patriotic impulses of the popular heart guided by the admonitory advice of the father of his country rose superior to all the difficulties of the incorporation of a new empire into the union 
in the councils of congress there was manifested extreme antagonism of opinion and action between some representatives who sought by the abusive and unconstitutional employment of the legislative powers of the government to interfere in the condition of the inchoate states and to impose their own social theories upon the latter and other representatives who repelled the interposition of the general government in this respect and maintained the self-constituting rights of the states in truth the thing attempted was in form alone action of the general government while in reality it was the endeavor by abuse of a legislative power to force the ideas of internal policy entertained in particular states upon allied independent states once more the constitution and the union triumphed signally the new territories were organized without restrictions on the disputed point and were thus left to judge in that particular for themselves and the sense of constitutional faith proved vigorous enough in congress not only to accomplish this primary object but also the incidental and hardly less important one of so amending the provisions of the statute for the extradition of fugitives from service as to place that public duty under the safeguard of the general government and thus relieve it from obstacles raised up by the legislation of some of the states vain declamation regarding the provisions of law for the extradition of fugitives from service with occasional episodes of frantic effort to obstruct their execution by riot and murder continued for a brief time to agitate certain localities but the true principle of leaving each state and territory to regulate its own laws of labor according to its own sense of right and expediency had acquired fast hold of the public's judgment to such a degree that by common consent it was observed in the organization of the territory of washington when more recently it became requisite to organize the territories of nebraska and kansas it was the natural and legitimate if not the inevitable consequence of previous events in legislation that the same great and sound principle which had already been applied to utah and new mexico should be applied to them that they should stand exempt from the restrictions proposed in the act relative to the state of missouri these restrictions were in the estimation of many thoughtful men null from the beginning unauthorized by the constitution contrary to the treaty stipulations for the cession of louisiana and inconsistent with the equality of these states they had been stripped of all moral authority by persistent efforts to procure their indirect repeal through contradictory enactments they had been practically abrogated by the legislation attending the organization of utah new mexico and washington if any vitality remained in them it would have been taken away in effect by the new territorial acts in the form originally proposed to the senate at the first session of the last congress it was manly and ingenious as well as patriotic and just to do this directly and plainly and thus relieve the statute book of an act which might be of possible future injury but of no possible future benefit and the measure of its repeal was the final consummation and complete recognition of the principle that no portion of the united states shall undertake through assumption of the powers of the general government to dictate the social institutions of any other portion the scope and effect of the language of repeal were not left in doubt it was declared in terms to be quote, the true intent and meaning of this act not to legislate slavery into any territory or state nor to exclude it therefrom but to leave the people thereof perfectly free to form and regulate their domestic institutions in their own way, subject only to the Constitution of the United States. End quote. The measure could not be withstood upon its merits alone. It was attacked with violence on the false or delusive pretext that it constituted a breach of faith. Never was objection more utterly destitute of substantial justification when before was it imagined by sensible men that a regulative or declarative statute whether enacted ten or forty years ago is irrepealable that an act of congress is above the constitution if indeed there were in the facts any cause to impute bad faith it would attach to those only who have never ceased from the time of the enactment of the restrictive provision to the present day to denounce and condemn it who have constantly refused to complete it by needful supplementary legislation, who have spared no exertion to deprive it of moral force, who have themselves again and again attempted its repeal by the enactment of incompatible provisions, 
and who by the inevitable reactionary effort of their own violence on the subject awaken the country to perception of the true constitutional principle of leaving the matter involved to the discretion of the people of the respective existing or incipient states it is not pretended that this principle or any other precludes the possibility of evils in practice disturbed as political action is liable to be by human passions no form of government is exempt from inconveniences but in this case they are the result of the abuse and not of the legitimate exercise of the powers reserved or conferred in the organization of a territory they are not to be charged to the great principle of popular sovereignty on the contrary they disappear before the intelligence and patriotism of the people exerting through the ballot box their peaceful and silent but irresistible power if the friends of the constitution are to have another struggle its enemies could not present a more acceptable issue than that of a state whose constitution clearly embraces quote, a republican form of government end quote, being excluded from the union because its domestic institutions may not in all respects comport with the ideas of what is wise and expedient entertained in some other state fresh from groundless imputations of breach of faith against others men will commence the agitation of this new question with indubitable violation of an express contract between the independent sovereign powers of the united states and of the republic of texas as well as of the older and equally solemn compacts which assure the equality of all the states but deplorable as would be such a violation of compact in itself and in all its direct consequences that is the very least of the evils involved when sectional agitators shall have succeeded in forcing on this issue can their pretensions fail to be met by counter pretensions will not different states be compelled respectively to meet extremes with extremes and if either extreme carry its point what is that so far forth but dissolution of the union if a new state formed from the territory of the united states be absolutely excluded from admission therein that fact of itself constitutes a disruption of union between it and the other states but the process of dissolution could not stop there would not a sectional decision producing such result by a majority of votes either northern or southern of necessity drive out the oppressed and aggrieved minority and place in presence of each other two irreconcilably hostile confederations it is necessary to speak thus plainly of projects the offspring of that sectional agitation now prevailing in some of the states which are as impractical as they are unconstitutional and which if persevered in must and will end calamitously it is either disunion and civil war or it is mere angry idle aimless disturbance of public peace and tranquillity disunion for what if the passionate rage of fanaticism and partisan spirit did not force the fact upon our attention it would be difficult to believe that any considerable portion of the people of this enlightened country could have so surrendered themselves to a fanatical devotion to the supposed interests of the relatively few africans in the united states as to totally abandon and disregard the interests of the twenty-five million americans to trample underfoot the injunctions of moral and constitutional obligation and to engage in plans of vindictive hostility against those who are associated with them in the enjoyment of the common heritage of our national institutions nor is it hostility against their fellow citizens of one section of the union alone the interests the honor the duty the peace and the prosperity of the people of all sections are equally involved and imperiled in this question and are patriotic men in any part of the union prepared on such issue thus madly to invite all the consequences of the forfeiture of their constitutional engagements it is impossible the storm of frenzy and faction must inevitably dash itself in vain against the unshaken rock of the constitution i shall never doubt it i know the union is stronger a thousand times than all the wild and chimerical schemes of social change which are generated one after another in the unstable minds of visionary sophists and interested agitators i rely confidently on the patriotism of the people on the dignity and self-respect of the states on the wisdom of congress and above all on the continued gracious favor of almighty god to maintain against all enemies 
whether at home or abroad, the sanctity of the Constitution and the integrity of the Union. End of section 14. Recording by Gary B. Clayton. Section 15 of State of the Union Addresses, 1849-1856. to 1856. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Franklin Pierce, December 2nd, 1856, Part 1. Fellow Citizens of the Senate and of the House of Representatives, the Constitution requires that the President shall from time to time not only recommend to the consideration of Congress such measures as he may judge necessary and expedient, but also that he shall give information to them of the State of the Union. To do this fully involves exposition of all matters in the actual condition of the country, domestic or foreign, which essentially concern the general welfare. While performing his constitutional duty in this respect, the President does not speak merely to express personal convictions, but as the executive minister of the government, enabled by his position and called upon by his official obligations to scan with an impartial eye the interests of the whole and of every part of the United States. Of the condition of the domestic interests of the Union, its agriculture, mines, manufactures, navigation, and commerce, it is necessary only to say that the internal prosperity of the country, its continuous and steady advancement in wealth and population, and in private as well as public well-being, attest the wisdom of our institutions, and the predominant spirit of intelligence and patriotism, which, notwithstanding occasional irregularities of opinion or action resulting from popular freedom, has distinguished and characterized the people of America. In the brief interval between the termination of the last and the commencement of the present session of Congress, the public mind has been occupied with the care of selecting for another constitutional term the President and Vice President of the United States. The determination of the persons who are of right, or contingently, to preside over the administration of the government is under our system committed to the states and the people. We appeal to them by their voice, pronounced in the forms of law, to call whomsoever they will to the high post of chief magistrate. And thus it is, that as the senators represent the respective states of the Union, and the members of the House of Representatives the several constituencies of each state, so the President represents the aggregate population of the United States. Their election of him is the explicit and solemn act of the sole sovereign authority of the Union. It is impossible to misapprehend the great principles which, by their recent political action, the people of the United States have sanctioned and announced. They have asserted the constitutional equality of each and all of the states of the Union as states. They have affirmed the constitutional equality of each and all of the citizens of the United States as citizens, whatever their religion, wherever their birth or their residence. They have maintained the inviolability of the constitutional rights of the different sections of the Union, and they have proclaimed their devoted and unalterable attachment to the Union and to the Constitution as objects of interest superior to all subjects of local or sectional controversy as the safeguard of the rights of all as the spirit and the essence of the liberty peace and greatness of the republic in doing this they have at the same time emphatically condemned the idea of organizing in these united states mere geographical parties of marshalling in hostile array toward each other the different parts of the country north or south east or west 
schemes of this nature fraught with incalculable mischief and which the considerate sense of the people has rejected could have had countenance in no part of the country had they not been disguised by suggestions plausible in appearance acting upon an excited state of the public mind induced by causes temporary in their character and it is to be hoped transient in their influence perfect liberty of association for political objects and the widest scope of discussion are the received and ordinary conditions of government in our country our institutions framed in the spirit of confidence in the intelligence and integrity of the people do not forbid citizens either individually or associated together to attack by writing speech or any other methods short of physical force the constitution and the very existence of the union under the shelter of this great liberty and protected by the laws and usages of the government they assail associations have been formed in some of the states of individuals who pretending to seek only to prevent the spread of the institution of slavery into the present or future inchoate states of the union are really inflamed with desire to change the domestic institutions of existing states to accomplish their objectives they dedicate themselves to the odious task of depreciating the government organization which stands in their way and of calumniating with indiscriminate invective not only the citizens of particular states with whose laws they find fault but all others of their fellow citizens throughout the country who do not participate with them in their assaults upon the constitution framed and adopted by our fathers and claiming for the privileges it has secured and the blessings it has conferred the steady support and grateful reverence of their children they seek an object which they well know to be a revolutionary one they are perfectly aware that the change in the relative condition of the white and black races in the slaveholding states which they would promote is beyond their lawful authority that to them it is a foreign object that it cannot be effected by any peaceful instrumentality of theirs that for them and the states of which they are citizens the only path to its accomplishment is through burning cities and ravaged fields and slaughtered populations and all there is most terrible and far and complicated with civil and servile war and that the first step in the attempt is the forcible disruption of a country embracing in its broad bosom a degree of liberty and an amount of individual and public prosperity to which there is no parallel in history and substituting in its place hostile governments driven at once and inevitably into mutual devastation and fratricidal carnage transforming the now peaceful and felicitous brotherhood into a vast permanent camp of armed men like the rival monarchies of europe and asia well knowing that such and such only are the means and the consequences of their plans and purposes they endeavor to prepare the people of the united states for civil war by doing everything in their power to deprive the constitution and the laws of moral authority and to undermine the fabric of the union by appeals to passion and sectional prejudice by indoctrinating its people with reciprocal hatred and by educating them to stand face to face as enemies rather than shoulder to shoulder as friends it is by the agency of such unwarrantable interference foreign and domestic that the minds of many otherwise good citizens have been so inflamed into the passionate condemnation of the domestic institutions of the southern states as at length to pass insensibly to almost equal passion late hostility toward their fellow citizens of those states and thus finally to fall into temporary fellowship with the avowed and active enemies of the constitution ardently attached to liberty in the abstract they do not stop to consider practically how the objects they would attain can be accomplished 
nor to reflect that even if the evil were as great as they deem it they have no remedy to apply and that it can be only aggravated by their violence and unconstitutional action a question which is one of the most difficult of all the problems of social institution political economy and statesmanship they treat with unreasoning intemperance of thought and language extremes beget extremes violent attack from the north finds its inevitable consequence in the growth of a spirit of angry defiance at the south thus in the progress of events we had reached that consummation which the voice of the people has now so pointedly rebuked of the attempt of a portion of the states by a sectional organization and movement to usurp the control of the government of the united states i confidently believe that the great body of those who inconsiderately took this fatal step are sincerely attached to the constitution and the union they would upon deliberation shrink with unaffected horror from any conscious act of disunion or civil war but they have entered into a path which leads nowhere unless it be to civil war and disunion and which has no other possible outlet they have proceeded thus far in that direction in consequence of the successive stages of their progress having consisted of a series of secondary issues each of which professed to be confined within constitutional and peaceful limits but which attempted indirectly what few men were willing to do directly that is to act aggressively against the constitutional rights of nearly one half of the thirty-one states in the long series of acts of indirect aggression the first was the strenuous agitation by citizens of the northern states in congress and out of it of the question of negro emancipation in the southern states the second step in this path of evil consisted of acts of the people of the northern states and in several instances of their governments aimed to facilitate the escape of persons held to service in the southern states and to prevent their extradition when reclaimed according to law and in virtue of express provisions of the constitution to promote this objective legislative enactments and other means were adopted to take away or defeat rights which the constitution solemnly guaranteed in order to nullify the then existing act of congress concerning the extradition of fugitives from service laws were enacted in many states forbidding their officers under the severest penalties to participate in the execution of any act of congress whatever in this way that system of harmonious cooperation between the authorities of the united states and of the several states for the maintenance of their common institutions which existed in the early years of the republic was destroyed conflicts of jurisdiction came to be frequent and congress found itself compelled for the support of the constitution and the vindication of its power to authorize the appointment of new officers charged with the execution of its acts as if they and the officers of the states were the ministers respectively of foreign governments in a state of mutual hostility rather than fellow magistrates of a common country peacefully subsisting under the protection of one well-constituted union thus here also aggression was followed by reaction and the attacks upon the constitution at this point did but serve to raise up new barriers for its defense and security the third stage of this unhappy sectional controversy was in connection with the organization of territorial governments and the admission of new states into the union when it was proposed to admit the state of maine by separation of territory from that of massachusetts and the state of missouri formed of a portion of the territory ceded by france to the united states representatives in congress objected to the admission of the latter unless with conditions suited to particular views of public policy the imposition of such a condition was successfully resisted 
but at the same period the question was presented of imposing restrictions upon the residue of the territory ceded by france that question was for the time disposed of by the adoption of a geographical line of limitation in this connection it should not be forgotten that when france of her own accord resolved for considerations of the most far-sighted sagacity to cede louisiana to the united states and that accession was accepted by the united states the latter expressly engaged that the inhabitants of the ceded territory shall be incorporated in the union of the united states and admitted as soon as possible according to the principles of the federal constitution to the enjoyment of all the rights advantages and immunities of citizens of the united states and in the meantime there shall be maintained and protected in the free enjoyment of their liberty property and the religion which they profess that is to say while it remains in a territorial condition its inhabitants are maintained and protected in the free enjoyment of their liberty and property with a right then to pass into the condition of states on a footing of perfect equality with the original states the enactment which established the restrictive geographical line was acquiesced in rather than approved by the states of the union it stood on the statute book however for a number of years and the people of the respective states acquiesced in the reenactment of the principle as applied to the state of texas and it was proposed to acquiesce in its further application to the territory acquired by the united states from mexico but this proposition was successfully resisted by the representatives from the northern states who regardless of the statute line insisted upon applying restriction to the new territory generally whether lying north or south of it thereby repealing it as a legislative compromise and on the part of the north persistently violating the compact if compact there was thereupon this enactment ceased to have binding virtue in any sense whether as respects the north or the south and so in effect it was treated on the occasion of the admission of the state of california and the organization of the territories of New mexico utah and washington such was the state of this question when the time arrived for the organization of the territories of kansas and nebraska in the progress of constitutional inquiry and reflection it had now at length come to be seen clearly that congress does not possess constitutional power to impose restrictions of this character upon any present or future state of the union in a long series of decisions on the fullest argument and after the most deliberate consideration the supreme court of the united states had finally determined this point in every form under which the question could arise whether as affecting public or private rights in questions of the public domain of religion of navigation and of servitude the several states of the union are by force of the constitution co-equal in domestic legislative power congress cannot change a law of domestic relation in the state of maine no more can it in the state of missouri any statute which proposes to do this is a mere nullity it takes away no right it confers none if it remains on the statute book unrepealed it remains there only as a monument of error and a beacon of warning to the legislature and the statesman to repeal it will be only to remove imperfection from the statutes without affecting either in the sense of permission or of prohibition the action of the states or of their citizens still when a nominal restriction of this nature already a dead letter in law was in terms repealed by the last congress in a clause of the act organizing the territories of kansas and nebraska that repeal was made the occasion of a widespread and dangerous agitation it was alleged that the original enactment being a compact of perpetual moral obligation its repeal constituted an odious breach of faith 
an act of congress while it remains unrepealed more especially if it be constitutionally valid in the judgment of those public functionaries whose duty it is to pronounce on that point is undoubtedly binding on the conscience of each good citizen of the republic but in what sense can it be asserted that the enactment in question was invested with perpetuity and entitled to the respect of a solemn compact between whom was the compact no distinct contending powers of the government no separate sections of the union treating as such entered into treaty stipulations on the subject it was a mere clause of an act of congress and like any other controverted matter of legislation received its final shape and was passed by compromise of the conflicting opinions or sentiments of the members of congress but if it had moral authority over men's consciences to whom did this authority attach not to those of the north who had repeatedly refused to confirm it by extension and who had zealously striven to establish other and incompatible regulations upon the subject and if as it thus appears the supposed compact had no obligatory forces as to the north of course it could not have had any as to the south for all such compacts must be mutual and of reciprocal obligation it is not unfrequently happened that lawgivers with undue estimation of the value of the law they give or in the view of imparting to it particular strength make it perpetual in terms but they cannot thus bind the conscience the judgment and the will of those who may succeed them invested with similar responsibilities and clothed with equal authority more careful investigation may prove the law to be unsound in principle experience may show it to be imperfect in detail and impracticable in execution and then both reason and right combine not merely to justify but to require its repeal the constitution supreme as it is over all the departments of the government legislative executive and judicial is open to amendment by its very terms and congress or the states may in their discretion propose amendment to it solemn compact though it in truth is between the sovereign states of the union in the present instance a political enactment which had ceased to have legal power or authority of any kind was repealed the position assumed that Congress had no moral right to enact such repeal was strange enough, and singularly so, in view of the fact that the argument came from those who openly refused obedience to existing laws of the land, having the same popular designation and quality as compromise acts, nay, more, who unequivocally disregarded and condemned the most positive and obligatory injunctions of the constitution itself and sought by every means within their reach to deprive a portion of their fellow citizens of the equal enjoyment of those rights and privileges guaranteed alike to all by the fundamental compact of our union this argument against the repeal of the statute lying in question was accompanied by another of congenial character and equally with the former destitute of foundation in reason and truth it was imputed that the measure originated in the conception of extending the limits of slave labor beyond those previously assigned to it and that such was its natural as well as intended effect and these baseless assumptions were made in the northern states the ground of unceasing assault upon constitutional right the repeal in terms of a statute which was already obsolete and also null for unconstitutionality could have no influence to obstruct or to promote the propagation of conflicting views of political or social institution when the act of organizing the territories of kansas and nebraska was passed the inherent effect upon that portion of the public domain thus opened to legal settlement 
was to admit settlers from all the states of the union alike each with his convictions of public policy and private interest there to found in their discretion subject to limitations as the constitution and acts of congress might prescribe new states hereafter to be admitted into the union it was a free field open alike to all whether the statute line of assumed restriction was repealed or not the repeal did not open to free competition of the diverse opinions and domestic institutions a field which without such repeal would have been closed against them it found that field of competition already opened in fact and in law all the repeal did was to relieve the statute book of an objectionable enactment unconstitutional in effect and injurious in terms to a large portion of the states is it the fact that in all the unsettled regions of the united states if emigration be left free to act in this respect for itself without legal prohibitions on either side slave labor will spontaneously go everywhere in preference to free labor is it the fact that the peculiar domestic institutions of the southern states possess relatively so much of vigor that wheresoever an avenue is freely opened to all the world they will penetrate to the exclusion of those of the northern states is it the fact that the former enjoy compared with the latter such irresistibly superior vitality independent of climate soil and all other accidental circumstances as to be able to produce the supposed result in spite of the assumed moral and natural obstacles to its accomplishment and of the more numerous population of the northern states the argument of those who advocate the enactment of new laws of restriction and condemn the repeal of old ones in effect avers that their particular views of government have no self-extending or self-sustaining power of their own and will go nowhere unless forced by act of congress and if congress do but pause for a moment in the policy of stern coercion if it venture to try the experiment of leaving men to judge for themselves what institutions will best suit them if it be not strained up to perpetual legislative exertion on this point if congress proceed thus to act in the very spirit of liberty it is at once charged with aiming to extend slave labor into all the new territories of the united states of course these imputations on the intentions of congress in this respect conceived as they were in prejudice and disseminated in passion are utterly destitute of any justification in the nature of things and contrary to all the fundamental doctrines and principles of civil liberty and self-government while therefore in general the people of the northern states have never at any time arrogated for the federal government the power to interfere directly with the domestic condition of persons in the southern states but on the contrary have disavowed all such intentions and have shrunk from conspicuous affiliations with those few who pursue their fanatical objects avowedly through the contemplated means of revolutionary change of the government and with acceptance of the necessary consequences a civil and servile war yet many citizens have suffered themselves to be drawn into one evanescent political issue of agitation after another appertaining to the same set of opinions and which subsided as rapidly as they rose when it came to be seen as it uniformly did that they were incompatible with the compacts of the constitution and the existence of the union thus when the acts of some of the states to nullify the existing extradition law imposed upon congress the duty of passing a new one the country was invited by agitators to enter into party organization for its repeal but that agitation speedily seized by reason of the impracticability of its object so when the statute restriction upon the institutions of new states by a geographical line had been repealed the country was urged to demand its restoration 
and that project also died almost with its birth. Then followed the cry of alarm from the north against imputed southern encroachments, which cry sprang in reality from the spirit of revolutionary attack on the domestic institutions of the South, and, after a troubled existence of a few months, has been rebuked by the voice of a patriotic people. Of this last agitation, one lamentable feature was that it was carried on at the immediate expense of the peace and happiness of the people of the territory of Kansas. That was made the battlefield, not so much of opposing factions or interests within itself, as of the conflicting passions of the whole people of the United States. Revolutionary disorder in Kansas had its origin in projects of intervention deliberately arranged by certain members of that Congress which enacted the law for its organization of the territory, and when propagandist colonization of Kansas had thus been undertaken in one section of the Union for the systematic promotion of its peculiar views of policy, there ensued, as a matter of course, a counteraction with opposite views in other sections of the Union. In consequence of these and other incidents, many acts of disorder, it is undeniable, have been perpetrated in Kansas, to the occasional interruption rather than the permanent suspension of regular government. Aggressive and most reprehensible incursions into the territory were undertaken both in the North and the South, and entered it on its northern border by the way of Iowa, as well as on the eastern by way of Missouri there had existed within it a state of insurrection against the constituted authorities, not without countenance from inconsiderate persons in each of the great sections of the Union. But the difficulties in the territory have been extravagantly exaggerated for purposes of political agitation elsewhere. The number and gravity of the acts of violence have been magnified, partly by statements entirely untrue, and partly by reiterated accounts of the same rumors or facts. Thus, the territory has been seemingly filled with extreme violence when the whole amount of such acts has not been greater than what occasionally passes before us in single cities to the regret of all good citizens, but without being regarded as of general or permanent political consequence imputed irregularities in the elections had in kansas like occasional irregularities of the same description in the states were beyond the sphere of action of the executive but incidents of actual violence or of organized obstruction of law pertinaciously renewed from time to time have been met as they occurred by such means as were available and as the circumstances required, and nothing of this character now remains to affect the general peace of the Union. The attempt of a part of the inhabitants of the territory to erect a revolutionary government, though sedulously encouraged and supplied with pecuniary aid from active agents of disorder in some of the states, has completely failed. Bodies of armed men, foreign to the territory, have been prevented from entering or compelled to leave. Predatory bands engaged in acts of rap and under cover of the existing political disturbances have been arrested or dispersed, and every well-disposed person is now enabled once more to devote himself in peace to the pursuits of prosperous industry for the prosecution of which he undertook to participate in the settlement of the territory. It affords me unmingled satisfaction, thus, to announce the peaceful condition of things in Kansas, especially considering the means to which it was necessary to have recourse for the attainment of the end, namely the employment of a part of the military force of the United States. The withdrawal of that force from its proper duty of defending the country against foreign foes or the savages of the frontier 
to employ it for the suppression of domestic insurrection is when the exigency occurs a matter of the most earnest solicitude on this occasion of imperative necessity it has been done with the best results and my satisfaction in the attainment of such results by such means is greatly enhanced by the consideration that through the wisdom and energy of the present executive of kansas and the prudence firmness and vigilance of the military officers on duty there tranquillity has been restored without one drop of blood having been shed in its accomplishment by the forces of the united states the restoration of comparative tranquillity in that territory furnishes the means of observing calmly and appreciating at their just value the events which have occurred there and the discussions of which the government of the territory has been the subject we perceive that controversy concerning its future domestic institutions was inevitable that no human prudence no form of legislation no wisdom on the part of congress could have prevented it it is idle to suppose that the particular provisions of their organic law were the cause of agitation those provisions were but the occasion or the pretext of an agitation which was inherent in the nature of things congress legislated upon the subject in such terms as were most consonant with the principle of popular sovereignty which underlies our government it could not have legislated otherwise without doing violence to another great principle of our institutions the imprescriptible right of equality of the several states we perceive also that sectional interests and party passions have been the great impediment to the salutary operation of the organic principles adopted and the chief cause of the successive disturbances in kansas the assumption that because in the organization of the territories of nebraska and kansas congress abstained from imposing restraints upon them to which certain other territories had been subject therefore disorders occurred in the latter territory is emphatically contradicted by the fact that none have occurred in the former those disorders were not the consequence in kansas of the freedom of self-government conceded to that territory by congress but of unjust interference on the part of persons not inhabitants of that territory such interference wherever it has exhibited itself by acts of insurrectionary character or of obstruction to process of law has been repelled or suppressed by all the means which the constitution and the laws place in the hands of the executive in those parts of the united states where by reason of the inflamed state of the public mind false rumors and misrepresentations have the greatest currency it has been assumed that it was the duty of the executive not only to suppress insurrectionary movements in kansas but also to see the regularity of local elections it needs little argument to show that the president has no such power all government in the united states rests substantially upon popular election the freedom of elections is liable to be impaired by the intrusion of unlawful votes or the exclusion of lawful ones by improper influences by violence or by fraud but the people of the united states are themselves the all-sufficient guardians of their own rights and to suppose that they will not remedy in due season any such incidents of civil freedom is to suppose them to have ceased to be capable of self-government the president of the united states has not power to interpose in elections to see to their freedom to canvass their votes or to pass upon their legality in the territories any more than in the states if he had such power the government might be republican in form but it would be a monarchy in fact and if he had undertaken to exercise it in the case of kansas he would have been justly subject to the charge of usurpation and a violation of the dearest rights of the people of the united states 
unwise laws equally with irregularities at elections are in periods of great excitement the occasional incidents of even the freest and best political institutions but all experience demonstrates that in a country like ours where the right of self-constitution exists in the completest form the attempt to remedy unwise legislation by resort to revolution is totally out of place inasmuch as existing legal institutions afford more prompt and efficacious means for the redress of wrong i confidently trust that now when the peaceful condition of kansas affords opportunity for calm reflection and wise legislation either the legislative assembly of the territory or congress will see that no act shall remain on its statute book violative of the provisions of the constitution or subversive of the great objects for which that was ordained and established and will take all other necessary steps to assure to its inhabitants the enjoyment without obstruction or abridgment of all the constitutional rights privileges and immunities of citizens of the united states as contemplated by the organic law of the territory full information in relation to recent events in this territory will be found in the documents communicated herewith from the departments of state and war end of section fifteen